Good morning, good morning. I'm on a couple of minutes early today. Good morning, greetings, greetings, greetings. Good morning to everyone. It's not that time yet. Get that last cup of coffee in. Get that tea in. Get that water. Whatever the case may be. We got a, we got a couple minutes here. I like to come on a few minutes early. To, they say to be on time is to be late, right? So I, I make sure that I'm early, right? So again, to be on time is to be late. So I, I get here early. We got a lot to talk about here. Come on in here, jump in, jump in. Tell a friend, tell a colleague, tell a family member, tell anybody. We back, week six, Principal Kefele, virtual assistant principal, leadership academy. Tell somebody, we still got another minute and some change. Tell somebody, hit that share button, Facebook. Hit that uh, retweet button, Twitter. Let folks know we're keeping it going. 18 weeks of Virtual Assistant Principal Leadership Academy. Let them know. I don't normally do the shout outs on the Saturday mornings as I did on the Sunday morning broadcast. But when I see the commissioner of education in New Jersey, I got to shout him out. You know, certain people you just have to shout out. So we got Dr. Lamont Repelet in the building, right? He's, uh, he's going to be the president of my alma mater, Kane University, very shortly. But um, for now, he's still the commissioner of education in New Jersey. So you got to, when you got the commissioner on, you got to shout out the commissioner. Right, so we're getting ready to get started, folks. Hit that share button. Hit that retweet button. Let them know. I know some people, because I hear the chatter sometimes, some people say, well, he does his announcements first, so we, you know, we'll chime in in about 10 minutes. You know, I've, I've actually read that on social media, but the announcements are, are crucial as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm just going to ask, request, that uh, you all join me even for the announcements. Um, I've got a packed agenda, but those announcements matter. So let me let me just jump right into them now. And I also know a lot of folks watch the video throughout the week because we, we had like about 35,000 views from Saturday to Saturday. But I want you guys to tune in live, you know, because I want I want you to feel my energy because because the energy that I have, I want you to have right in terms of just how you go about doing your business, how you, how you, how you, how you unpack the work that you do. So, so join me live on Saturday mornings and let somebody else know to join me as well. So let's, let's jump into it. Last week and today is June 6th, week six, right? Last week, um, I, I deviated as you all know that tuned in and we, we talked about, uh, social justice education in the context of the, the murder of George Floyd and the unrest that, that emanated out of it, right? So we, so we did a whole hour just talking about our role as educators, partic uh, specifically our role as assistant principals or school leaders as it relates to children in the school, in the computer virtually, however it is we interact with young people. So I'm, I'm going to get back to why you guys came on to decided to be a part of this in terms of the curriculum that I had for it. I'm going to, I'm going to do that, but I do want to say this, um, two things. Number one, I, I did an interview with the Milken, uh, foundation, the organization that, that gives the Milken award, which I'm a recipient in 09. And it was, we, they interviewed me last week, an article called how to talk to students about social justice. So, um, please read that. You can go to my Facebook page, and just scroll down and you'll see a picture of myself and a whole lot of young men, my high school young men when I was um, back as, as a high school principal. So you'll see the picture there and that's it. Or it might just be a picture of me talking to some 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 colleagues. So whatever it is, that's the article. Or you can go to the Milken website. I'm not sure of what it is, milken.org, Milken. I don't, I don't know what the website is, but just Google Milken. And it's right there at the top of their website, right? So you just click that. You'll see my photo and you click that. And then you have it. Secondly, there were a lot of people that were writing me over the course of the past two weeks who were asking me for recommendations on books to read. And, and, and let me be very specific here. You know, we're educators, so I think we can be specific and raw and all that. These were white educators. 
and I was getting many requests from white educators asking me for recommendations of books to read that dealt with race, uh, privilege, white supremacy. These, 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 these are requests that were coming my way. So I want you to hear me well on this, and then I'm going to transition to my, my actual topic for the day. I, when I was getting those requests, there's a lot of books out there that, that critique and analyze race, privilege, supremacy. There, there's, there's a plethora of books out there. But because of my background in reading history, I couldn't recommend those books as a starting place. For me, in order to understand race and its implications in, in, in 2020, in the 21st century, you have to have a historical understanding of the relationship between blacks and whites from the inception of this country, right? So you gotta, you, you gotta go back into the, the, the uh, uh, 1619, the first landing of African Americans here. You, you, gotta, you gotta go there and you gotta understand that, but you don't start there either because you gotta go back into Africa, right? And you gotta understand who these African-American people are today. You gotta understand who they were historically speaking. So you gotta go way back into Africa. So 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 going, going back hundreds, if not thousands of years before enslavement, the enslavement period, right? So did you understand that you're talking about a people that, it, that had contributed much to the world? So when we talk about the spread of civilization, right? You can't have that conversation with, without talking about the African contribution, which is vast. So I wouldn't want someone who's a neophyte, who, who, who doesn't have, a, who doesn't have a, a deep learning and understanding of racial dynamics, racial tensions right now, and just go in and read that book. I want you to go back into time. And I want you to I want you to study at least have an overview of African people prior to the period of enslavement and then go into slave trade and then slavery beginning in, in 1619. Enslavement is a better word in 1619 and work your way to the present. So that will entail a whole lot of work. Right. I'll tell you right now, that's a whole lot of reading. Like like just the books on the shelf here. And, and I'm using a smaller lens today so you can't even see them all. That's just a little bit of the story. The my library is vast, and I'm saying of, of that genre of books. And I'm saying to you, if you're gonna understand 2020, if you're gonna understand June 6, 2020, you can't pick up a book that analyzes race in isolation. The book is great. There's phenomenal stuff out there. I know it because I've read a lot of it. But I'm saying you got to go back into history and understand that historical relationship between blacks and whites. Right. And then as you understand that historical relationship from from 1619 to 1719 to 1819 to 1919 to 2019 to 2020. Now you gain a stronger appreciation. I need some water, y'all. Too early to be on fire, right? So <clears throat> now and then you begin to, to, to develop that understanding of what this is and what the roles are of us to correct it, to rectify it, right? But if you if but if you study racism and isolation and you don't have historical foundation, then 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 then, then you're you're missing a huge chunk of what it is you need to know. So make sure you do that. Now, now, now let's go further because someone's, someone is on here right now. I'm, I, I, I promise you, I haven't read it, but I'm, I promise you there's someone on here saying, but what do I read? And I, and my response is, I'm glad you asked because let two, about two, three days ago, I posted a book list of 150 books that I said, here, here's a start. And, and all of them are not history books. They're broken down into various categories, but there was a lot of stuff, a lot of books, a lot of material on there that I said, this is what you want to read. So then folks said, man, Kefele, this is overwhelming. Can you like point, suggest a few or a couple? And I did just that the next day. And it, and it says in, in, in the title, it said to my, to my white friends out there who are looking for information, right? That's how, that's how, so if you scroll my page, you'll find it from last week, midweek. Or if you go to 
Principal Kefele writes. That's my blog page, dot com. Just scroll way back and you'll see the list. So recommended books by Principal Kefele, something like that. But but here's the two. You can write these down. I said, if you want if you want something to just start off, read Af uh, Introduction to African Civilizations by John Jackson. That's number one. Write that down. Introduction to African Civilizations so that you have so that you can gain a sense of the African people prior to enslavement. Like, like who were because see America and the world have 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 port, have portrayed, created and portrayed these just various different stereotypes of what an African of what an African was, what an African is, right? So this book will, will dispel those stereotypes and give you a deep understanding of what an African is, what an African was in that period, right? So Introduction to African Civilizations by John Jackson, that's dealing with Africa. Now I want you to understand America before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett Jr. I want you to read those two. Right. So, again, you can get them. You can get them both on Amazon. Introduction to African Civilization by John Jackson and Before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett, Jr. Both books important. Both books considered classics. Both books I highly recommend in, in, in terms of you gaining that understanding, because as you begin to infuse, if you haven't already, social justice education into your classroom and particularly if you've got. African American children in your classroom. You cannot do it justice if you do not have a historical understanding. Because if you don't have the historical understanding, that means you really don't understand what it is that you're seeing, what it is you're observing, and in some cases, what it is that you are participating in, whether it be unconsciously, implicitly, or explicitly, because you don't have that base, right? So I want you to get that. So for those of you that just tuned in, I'm just recapping last week before I get to my topic. So second, so so next, and I'm almost done. I left you with a parting question last week in this context. I said, take a deep, honest, self-reflective, self-assessing look at you, at who you are, at who you currently are as a social justice educator. Just take a deep, self-reflective look at yourself. As a, as a social justice educator, as a social justice leader, and determine areas of deficiency and what you need to do to strengthen them. So in the, 20th, in the 21st century, and I don't have to confine it to the 21st century, I can say the 20th century, the 19th century, you can't be an educator without being a social justice educator because you always have to take into consideration the world of the student beyond the subject area that you teach. If, if your focus is solely the subject area that, that, that you teach, then you're missing the, the fuller, the larger component of the youngster, right? And as I, as I, as I just went like this, I noticed my shirt. So for those, because, you know, I tell y'all, what these Negro League jerseys. So this is Harlem. Since Harlem Globetrotters, believe it or not, the Harlem Globetrotters basketball team had a baseball team. Right. It was an exhibition team, but it was a, but they had a baseball team. So this is a Harlem Globetrotters Negro League jersey. That's me just dropping a little bit more history on you because that's all I wear on these broadcasts on my Negro League jerseys. Next, got to tell you, it's finally back in stock. Amazon, get your copy. Those of you who have been waiting for copies, it's, as you've been getting those notifications, they're coming. But if you if you haven't ordered Get it, because I'm using it today as we talk about instructional leadership. So get your copy. It's in stock. 10,000 copies out there. Amazon, ASCD, Barnes & Noble, you name it. It's available. Get your copy. Now, last thing, and then I'm, I'm done. I said this last week. I got to say it again. Hey, y'all, if there's anybody out there that's been writing me for seeking advice, right, you all know I've I got I got 11 books on the market. I've got zillions of videos on YouTube. I do these free lives all year long. It's not just this. When you're sending me like a hundred letters of 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 uh, le a hundred letters seeking advice all week, and I, I'm not exaggerating the number. I can't read them all. It's just not humanly possible, and I definitely can't respond to them all. So I'm saying that to say this to you. I will try my best to respond to as many as I can, but it is not humanly possible to even read them all. And I get just, it's like equivalent to bags of mail 
saying, I need advice with this, 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 and this. I'm honored that people have faith in me to give them my, my two cents, but it's just not humanly possible for me to respond to all of it. So I don't want you, oh, man, I don't like Kefele, man, because he don't respond to nothing. Man, I, I sought advice from him, and he didn't even answer me. I can't, not all of them, right? So I'm done. Let's get into it. Um, the, the, for, for anyone that's new to this, we have, we have an overarching question to undergird everything that we're doing for the 18 weeks. And that question is, does my assistant principalship benefit my school academically? Once again, does my assistant principalship benefit my school academically? See, I'm not talking about if it benefits your school in any other component, any other aspect of your leadership. I'm asking what is the correlation between your leadership and achievement, academic success, of young people, right? So that's that's the overarching question to the entire academy, 18 weeks. I just want you to keep that in the back of your mind at, at all times as we go through this. So so here we are in, in week six, and today's uh, topic, and we could all even call it an, almost an objective, but I didn't word it that way, but the topic is instructional leadership, an inherent part of my day. Man, let's stay right there for a second. Is instructional leadership an inherent part of my day? Right? So let's let's look, let's let's break this down a little bit. Let's look at that word inherent, right? Hey, Facebook, do me a favor, hit that share button for me. Cause there, there's some AP out there that needs to hear this but doesn't know I'm on. Or there's some principal out there that supervises an AP, but 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 is util utilizing this individual as a disciplinarian. Right. So so Twitter, hit that retweet for me. Let them know there's someone out there that needs this because the implications are the children. Right. That's the implications. So if 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 I'm AP and I'm a disciplinarian, then at what point am I an instructional leader? Right. So, again, is instructional leadership an inherent part or component of my day? Let's look at let's let's look at this word inherent. Because that's, that's the key word there. That's the operative word. I'm asking you, as you reflect upon your day, is there something about instructional leadership that is woven into what you do? Woven into your leadership? Woven into your practice? Like, like these letters, it says Harlem. They're sewn into the shirt. So there is no shirt. These, these, these stripes here. They're sewn into the shirt. There is no shirt that, that looks like this without the word Harlem in it, without the red stripes, without the blue sewn into the red, etc. It's woven in. It's an inherent part of the shirt. Now watch this, somebody. If I were to get myself a, 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 a razor blade or, or some scissors and I cut the letters off and I cut the, 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 um, the stripes off, that changes the entire identity of the shirt. It changes, it, 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 it transforms the identity of the shirt, right? So now what the shirt represented, what the shirt is about, it's no longer there. It's taken on a brand new identity. So this is an inherent, What's the, what distinguishes this shirt from the other shirt is the fact that it says Harlem and in the colors that is written that that, that is that is sewn in. So now let's look at you. Is instructional leadership an inherent component, an inherent part of your day? Now, if 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 not, then the whole structure, the whole complexion of your leadership is something very different from what this question is implying. So I'm saying to you, as I'm just on the topic, I'm saying I want you to, I, I want you to take a deep dive in terms of your own self-reflection and ask yourself, to what extent is instructional leadership an inherent part of my day? Now, we, we, we getting ready to go in, y'all. Like I'm, I'm just on the surface right now. We, we getting ready to go in. So, 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 a, a Facebook. Let somebody know. Put on that share. Say Kefele getting ready to go in now. 
Hey, hey, Twitter, just, just on that retweet, on the comment, Kefele is getting ready to go in, right? So let, let, let's do that. Watch this. Now, I'm using the book today, right? So I'm, 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 I'm using pa pages 20 and 21 for those that have it. Now, I know some people, they like, oh, man, man, you just ticked me off, Kefele. You, you talking about you going in the book. I, I ordered my book in April, and I still don't have it, and you going in the book? I know, y'all. I know. I know. Work with me, y'all. Work with me. Work with me. So, so, but I, but, I, but you still going to get it because I'm going to read everything that I'm using, right? So now here, I, you know, I always use the tens. I always got these self-reflective questions for y'all. That's at the core of what we do here. So I got ten today. It's eleven nineteen now. I got ten today, right? <laughs> so, so ride with me. I don't care how long I take. I'm gonna try to finish this up by by um by eleven by twelve o'clock Eastern time, though, right? Question number one: What exactly is instructional leadership? And what does it mean to my practice as an AP? Now, here, here's, here's the difference between this question and the, and the topic. I'm asking you, what is it? Because, see, I, I've been in this business for a long time. Y'all know that you see all this gray. I ain't, you know, I ain't never had this in my life, but it's this my COVID look, right? So, so I, got, I, got, I got some years on me. I'm probably older than most of y'all, right? So, so here's the thing. I've been in this thing for a minute. That's slang. I've been in it for a while. And, and I'm saying to you, there's a lot of different definitions and interpretations. Like, what is instructional leadership? What does that mean? Right. And, 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 and what I'm saying to you, and, and, then, and then I add it to it. And what does it mean to your practice? Right. What does it mean to your work? See, see, when, 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 when I'm thinking about or talking about instructional leadership, Man, see, I'm talking about that leader that literally leads the instruction, right? Leads the instruction. So there, you, there, there's not a teacher in the building that is working in isolation from the leadership. See, there, there's no way in the world it could be a them and a us in an, in, 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 within an instructional leadership format in a school. It, it, it's, it, it's not going to work. It's not a them, the teachers or staff and them or us, the administration, because then the instructional leadership will never reach optimal levels. It won't happen. So instead, it's a us as in, as educators, but the leadership leads the effort instructionally in this regard. See, so, so in other words, what I'm saying to you, here you've got a teacher that's teaching, but here you are the leader of the professional growth and development of that teacher, leader of the professional growth and development of staff. That's, that's you. See, that's you. So the question is, are you a leader in that effort? See, are you leading in that effort? So you, so, so that's why you got to now go back. You got to go back into you. You got to you got to engage in that self-reflection. Who am I? And here's the question. Here's the operative question. Who am I in relationship to the professional growth and development of my staff? And I'm talking to you, assistant principal. Of course, I can pose that question to the principal. But I'm posing it to you, assistant principal. But I'm also posing it to the principal in relationship to who you are regarding your assistant principal, how you utilize your assistant principal, right? So what is the correlation between your leadership and the professional growth and development of your staff? That's what this question is asking. What exactly is instructional leadership and what does it mean to my practice as an AP? So now let, let's go deeper because I got a sub question. You know, we talk about sub tweeting. I got, I got this sub question. It says, do I have a philosophy, beliefs, opinions, ideas about how children learn based upon my own research, my own study, my own reading, my own experiences? Man, I need to read that to you again because I'm, I'm getting ready to go in on that question. It's a sub question to the one that's on the floor. Do I have a philosophy, beliefs, opinions, ideas 
about how children learn. Let, matter of fact, let me not even read the rest of the question yet. Let me just let me let me just hit it right there. Do I have a philosophy, beliefs, opinions, ideas about how children learn? Stop it right there. Now here's what I'm asking you. Have do do you have do you have a philosophy? Because there's no universal, right? But do you have a philosophy, beliefs, opinions, ideas about how children learn? If, if you and I have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, can can I ask you the question, hey, 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 so hey, Mr. So-and-so, hey, Miss So-and-so, hey, Dr. So-and-so, tell me, Doc. Tell me, Miss, Mrs. Tell me, Mr. Tell me, sir, tell me, ma'am. How do children learn? How do children think? How do children process information? How do children make sense out of information? And then, ideally, I want you to throw that back at me. I want you to answer the question, right? Now, let's say hypothetically you went like this and said, you saw a scratch in your head, right? And you went like this. Hmm. You know something, Principal Kefele? That's a darn good question. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You can't answer that that way. Because if, 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 if you're an instructional leader, right, at XYZ ABC school, and now someone came to you, hey, hey, hey how do children learn? And you said, man, I, I ain't never thought about that, man. Huh. You have to be able to answer that. Now, there's no universal answer. There are people out here that probably think they have the answer, but there's no universal answer. But here's what I'm saying as it relates to your leadership. Hear me, somebody. I'm saying to you that when they, well, well, first, let me ask the question. Do I have a philosophy, beliefs, opinions, and ideas about how children learn, how they think? think, how they process information, how they make sense out of information. So now let's add the, add the rest of the questions. I know a lot of y'all make those charts and use them in various different chats throughout the week. So the rest of the question say how they learn based upon my own research, reading, and experiences. Now let's break that down. Let's break it down. I'm, I'm, I'm going a little deeper with this now. You might want to hit that share button because it's, it's some AP out there trying to figure out how can I come up with the best discipline program in the 2020-21 school year? That's where they're thinking. They just think, man, I got to come up with a better discipline program, right? So that person needs to be on here today because if that's what they sitting at home doing on Saturday, man, I got to come up with a better discipline problem. The consequences are not strong enough. Oh my God, we, we're destroying kids, right? So Twitter, let them know. Facebook, let them know. Next week, I'm going to have both of these on the same camera. I got, I, man, I spent some money last week, y'all. It's going to be a different experience, but, but enough for that. Here, listen. I'm saying to you, I want, I want you, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take you to a football game on this one. Watch this. Watch this. You go to a football game. You got fans in the stadium, right in the arena, in the stadium. Now, you got two different kind of people at the game. Watch this, y'all. Take You might want to take notes on this one. You got the true fan and you got the spectator. Those are two different people. See, the true fan that's at that game, that not only does that person love their team, but they know the game. That's key. They know the game. So, so what they know what they're watching. So when so so now when 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 the game is being played, they understand the play. You hear me? So, so like with the with like each each man on the field has a different assignment. There's no two people on the field with the same assignment. The true fan understands each person's assignment. The quarterback, the running back, the receiver, the lineman, etc. They understand their role. So I'm saying to you, that fan, that's that 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 person knows the game inside and out. So when things go wrong, when mistakes are made, right? They understand that. They know what they're watching. So that's the fan. Now let's 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 go across the aisle and there's someone else in the stadium. The spectator. The spectator, let's say this person, they're not a true fan. It's they just they 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 just one of your friends. Like you the fan and you want to bring your friend, you want to bring your boy, your girl, whatever it is, to the game. So now here it is. 
Your friend comes, but your friend knows nothing about football. In fact, your friend don't even know sports. Let's go further. Your friend don't even like sports. Your friend just likes you and came with you to be in company with you. So now your friend is watching the game and don't know what's going on. Don't know which 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 end zone is the one to score in. It's that bad, right? So they just there. When they see the fans cheer, they cheer, right? So they don't really know what's going on. I, 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 I need you to understand that as I make this point. So now you got the fan that knows the game and you got the spectator that's just there to watch so I can hang with my homie, right? So now watch this. Watch this, y'all. Let's go back to my question. Do I have a philosophy, beliefs, opinions, and ideas about how children learn, period? Now watch this. Watch this. Because someone said, where is he going with this? I'm asking you, assistant principal, when you walk into a classroom, to observe instruction. Are you in that classroom as a fan or a spectator? You ain't hear that. You didn't hear me. Hey, assistant principal, when you walk into that classroom, hey, principal, when you walk into that classroom, are you walking in as a fan, a true fan of the game, or are you walking in as a spectator? Let's look at the difference now. Man, it's, it's some assistant principal that's not hearing me this morning. They, they home, man. They, 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 they missing this one. So, so let them know because they could watch the video later. Because if you got an assistant principal out here right now that's a spectator, oh, my God, it's not going to work. Because watch this. Watch this. The fan is, is, is not going into the game being dazzled by what might look good. See, that's the spectator. Spectator see somebody running down the field and, 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 and might be dazzled by the fact they're running down the field, but, they, but the team is losing by 30. So we don't care too much about that, right? So, but, see that, that, but, but see that fan of the game, and, and, and then if the, if the person that's, that runs down the field with the ball scores a touchdown and does some little end zone dance, right? But we down by 30. The fan is going to be like, so what? The spectator is going to be like, oh, my God, this is great. Man. <laughs> this, did you see that move he did in the end zone, that little dance thing he did? Well, let's take that to the classroom, y'all. You walking into the classroom, and the instruction looks good. Somebody said, I'm on fire today. Let me tell you something. I'm blazing. It's sweat. I'm sweating already. Listen, the instruction looks good. It looks good but it's not connecting with anybody. The children aren't learning, but it looks good, man. Oh, man, it looks good. Looks good. Give them, give them an Oscar, right? Give them a Grammy with the singing, right? Give them, give them an award. It looks good. But here's what I'm saying, somebody. If you're not a true fan of the game, quote unquote, then you don't know the difference between substance, right? Right? And show you don't know the difference because you're not a true fan. You don't you can't distinguish substance from show. I'm not accusing anybody of putting on a show. Don't get me wrong. But I am saying this. I'm saying that there, if it's a class of 25 youngsters in the room, there could be 25 different learning styles in the room. I'm asking you, are you a true fan of the game? Meaning you have a belief, opinions, philosophy, ideas on how children learn. You understand what the students in that classroom need before you walk in there. You're not walking in that classroom and you observe an instruction and then and you dazzle because it looks good. You're dazzled because it is reaching each individual in an equitable format. See, so that's the difference. So, so now next time you walk into a classroom, I want you to think about this. And I want you to ask yourself the question, am I a fan? In other words, do I go in here knowing what's necessary to connect with that child and that child and that child? Matter of fact, better word would be that scholar, that scholar, that scholar. That scholar, that scholar up there in the Twitterverse, that scholar, do I go in there with that understanding of the of the kind and quality of instruction that is in, that is required for the students that attend my school? 
and, and, and are in the classrooms of the teachers that I supervise? Because if not, your instructional leadership will always be flawed. Always. See? So, 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 so think about the two. Are you a fan? Or are you a spectator? Y'all, I'm still in question number one because I gave you a sub question. I got a second sub question now, right? Number, number, letter B. So one B. Do I understand that my main priority is student achievement and the continued improvement of instruction. One, once again, do I understand that my main priority is student achievement and the continued improvement of instruction? Man, let's let's break that down, y'all. Students are in school for, for a lot of reasons, right? Teachers are in school to teach. But I'm talking about you now, your priority. Your, your, your number one numero uno priority as assistant principal is not to be the lead disciplinarian, to not to supervise an excellent cafeteria, <laughs> to not be the best bus supervisor ever born. That's, 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 that's not your main priority. Your main priority, I don't care if you number two, number three, number four, you know, you came on board last and you got APs who've been there. I'm telling you, that regardless of where you, they may have ranked you. Hopefully they haven't ranked you. But wherever you are, your main priority, regardless, is student achievement. Matter of fact, let me word that differently. Same thing. Let's talk about the custodian for a hot second. The custodian, his or her main priority, watch this, is student achievement. Someone out there was thinking the custodian's main priority was, was cleaning the, the building. No. You got to go deeper than that. Let's look at security. Someone said the main priority of security is to keep the building safe. No. Someone said the secretary's main priority is to do the, 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 the clerical work that that, that that person does. No. The main priority of everybody employed in that building and the volunteers is student achievement. So now the custodian, yes, he, clean, he or she cleans the building, but cleans the building as the vehicle to student achievement. How am I going to learn in filth? I can't learn in filth. I can't do this message in filth, right? So I'm saying to you that the cleanliness of the building is the vehicle to student achievement. The safety of the building is the vehicle to student achievement. The, the clerical secretarial work that the secretary does is the vehicle to student achievement, right? The, so, so, so you look, the paraprofessional, the same thing. The, oh, here's a big one. The lunch, the cafeteria workers, you might think their priority is serving food. It's what they do. But their main priority is student achievement. And the work they do is the vehicle, again, to get there. So I'm saying to you, shift your thinking. Everybody in the building, their main priority is student achievement. So now let's look at you as assistant principal. Hey, assistant principal watching me. Hey, assistant principal that will see this video later in the week or today. I'm asking you, is your main priority student achievement? And if it is, then I'm asking you, what's the evidence? When I used, you know, sometimes I, I read these, I read the comments, but, late, but since I've been doing this Saturday Academy, we're averaging like 2,000 comments per Saturday. So I can't read 2,000. So I kind of just spot read, you know, do it that way and read what I can, right? But, but somebody put on here, because maybe I'll catch it in, in your comments in terms of what's the evidence? What are you doing? Put it out there on Front Street so that we can see what it is that you're doing that confirms that student achievement is your priority. So student achievement and, I'm coupling this now, the continued improvement in instruction. Oh, man. Those are vital, right? So now let's, let's, let's man, it's 1130-something, 30 38. Let, let's, let's go to number two. I got 10 questions, y'all. Let's, let's go to number two. Number two said, does instructional leadership define, I'm sorry, yeah, does instructional leadership define my primary role as an assistant principal. Let me read it to you again. Does instructional leadership 
and actually say, therefore, as it related to the one prior, does it therefore define my primary role as an assistant principal? Now, I, I've, I've, so for those of you that have been riding with me for the whole six weeks, then you know I've said in, in previous videos, it's certain, I'm being transparent, vulnerable. It didn't, it, it didn't define what I did. I was not an instructional leader as an assistant principal, right? Not because I didn't want to be. I wasn't given the permission. And that's why I want you guys, as, as, or, or, or the circumstances just wouldn't allow it. And that's why I want these principals to be on these calls too, or on, on, in these sessions as well, and also to buy the assistant principal 50 because I'm talking to the principal. I'm talking to the assistant superintendent. I'm talking to the superintendent. I'm saying to you that as the assistant principal, it's got to define your leadership. It's got to define your role. It's got to. Now, let's uh, for those of you that have the book, let's 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 jump into it. I'm going to I'm going to page 20. Right. Go go quick because, uh, you know, the time is racing. I'm just going right to page 20. Right. And I want to I want to share something with you here. I'm in the second paragraph in the middle and I'm just going to read it. It says, as an, as an administrative leader in your school and in your case, as an assistant principal, it says AP in the book, the instructional aspect of your leadership is absolutely crucial. And then I wrote, I repeat and wrote it italicized. The instructional aspect of your leadership is absolutely crucial, right? So, so, so with that, and I'm, again, for those that, that pulled your books out late, I was on page uh, 20, right in the middle of the second paragraph. So with that is question three to accompany what I just read. Would I consider the instructional aspect of my leadership to be a crucial component of my overall leadership? And what is the evidence? Right. What, what I consider it a crucial component of what I do. So I want you to think of your day. You go back, say, from the time you enter the building until the time the students leave. Matter of fact, from the time the teachers leave, because there's always those post observation conferences. And by the way, this instructional aspect of this broadcast, this academy, I'm doing this over five weeks. So you, it's, it's a lot I'm not going to talk about today as as regards instructional leadership. You can go ahead and read ahead. But there's a lot I'm not talking about because I broke it up into five weeks so that I don't spend over an hour on any one section. Right. So, again, what 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 would I consider the instructional aspect of my leadership to be a con uh, a crucial component of my overall leadership? And what is the evidence? So now let's let's keep it going. I'm still on page 20. And I'm saying here I'm right. I'm right down at the bottom. It says your effectiveness as an instructional leader can be the difference between the success or failure of a child. I got to read that again. Your effectiveness as an instructional leader can be the difference between the success or failure of a child. So I, so I give you an example here, which is not in the book. Two teachers fresh out of college. One has a great instructional leader. The other does not. Let's look at that. You got two brand new teachers. Let's say that they, they, they went to some university and learned how to be effective with the, um, with the generic child. You know that child that doesn't exist, right? So now they're with the, with the generic child. And now they decide they want to work in an urban school with these children of color, black and brown, black, African-American, Latino. And, and, and now they've got this instructional leader that understands equity, that understands instructional leadership, that, that understands cultural responsiveness, that understands cultural relevance, that understands equity, right? That understands student centeredness. So now you've got this leader that understands those components with teachers that know nothing about it, right? I'm just, I'm just being hypothetical right now. So that, cause, cause their training was with the generic child in the suburban school where there's privilege and wealth and, and, and the issues are not what they are in an urban setting, right? So now the one school, the one, the, so the one school's got this instructional leader that gets it, right? That gets it, understands what these teachers need in order to be great. It's not that they need to be from the community. It's that there's certain professional development that they need in order to be great. So now this leader gets it and provides it, sustains it over the course of the time that they're in that building, not just the year. But then 
you've got this, this, this other leader somewhere else down the highway somewhere with this other new teacher, same characteristics, but the difference is this leader knows nothing about equitable practices from the vantage point of the leader. This leader knows nothing about solid instructional leadership. This leader knows nothing about social justice education. This leader knows nothing about cultural responsive teaching and learning. This leader knows nothing about culturally relevant teaching and learning. This leader knows nothing about true student-centered education, right? So now you've got the two teachers coming out of the same experience in college, but they come into a school where the student population overlaps. It's very similar, but the difference is the leader. So now one teacher is assigned to an instructional leader that does not know instructional leadership. Hey, assistant principal out there, you cannot be optimally effective. You cannot even be okay effective, average effective, mediocre effective if you don't understand your role as an instructional leader in all the facets of it. So again, that note I just read to you, two teachers fresh out of college, one has a great instructional leader, the other does not. The effect on children could be detrimental and it could be permanent, right? Because we know that experiences in school in, 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 in real time can have implications for children 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. We know that on the plus side and the negative side. So we want to make sure, right? So, so, so with that, I want to read one more thing. I'm on page 21 for those of you that have the book. It says, as an AP, the success of both the staff you supervise and the students you lead demands that you be an effective instructional leader. There's simply no way around it. Great, and then I wrote a note on the bottom, great students can be completely broken due to poor instructional leadership. Man, I, I, I got to say that again because somebody didn't hear me. Great students, high-performing students, students who are coming in ready to soar, ready to meet the, meet, meet the, meet the challenges. I'm saying to you, Great students, focused students, students who are serious, came in, they, they came into class this way. Serious, focused, diligent workers, disciplined in their actions, and resilient. And then they got a horrible instructional leader working with that teacher. Let me tell you something. Those children can be broken in that environment. What's the proof? It has happened umpteen times. It demands your strong instructional leadership, right? So now, man, look what time it is, 11.46, and I'm only on question four. Let, put your seatbelts on, y'all. We, we let, let, let me pick it up. I got 10 questions. <laughs> Here we go. What does instructional leadership look like for me during the normal course of a day? I kind of jumped into that, so I can skip to number five. What role, but I know someone was taking notes, so let me read it again. What does instructional leadership look like for me during the normal course of a day? I've been, I've been overlapping, so I got that. Number five, what does self-reflection, self-assessment, and self-adjustment play? What role do they play in my overall instructional leadership? So again, what role does self-reflection, self-assessment, and self-adjustment play in my overall instructional leadership? Here's what I'm saying. Here's what I'm saying. I'm saying as a as a as an assistant principal on a daily basis, even during a global pandemic, for those of you who are still in school, you're still supervising staff, you're still evaluating staff, you still got to be that person because even during a pandemic, they still have to grow, and students still have to learn and achieve. So I'm I'm asking you, as it relates to this question, what role does self reflection play in your practice? We talked about it earlier in the, in the academy a few weeks ago, but in a different context. What role does just you going deep into yourself, at analyzing, watching you, what role does it play toward you becoming better at what you do as an instructional leader? Self-assessment, what role does self-assessment play toward you evaluating your leadership as assistant principal? 
And then what role does self-adjustment play as you make adjustments to your practice? Because you cannot, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot be the same person two consecutive days. You have to grow. Today is June 6th. You have to have grown by June 7th. You cannot be the same person on June 6th, on June 7th. You have to have grown intellectually. And, 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 and quite frankly, I hope that just this broadcast, this academy is helping some of the leaders to grow relative to their practice, right? So let's go to another one. Number six, what is the purpose of my supervision uh, of, of my staff relative to instruction? So, so this is a different question now. I'm asking you, what is the purpose of your supervision? Now, I shared with you in week one where I'm going now, but I had a different context and I have probably got a lot of new faces on here too. So let me, let me share this with you. I'm doing my internship to become an assistant principal back in 1995, 95, 96 school year and or 96, 97 might be better. So my mentor, when I was doing my internship, he talked to me every day. We go into a conference room and he, he'd lecture to me, talk to me, ask me questions, check on how I was doing because I was doing this, this apprenticeship. So then we, we, so every day we're conversing, he and my, my principal and, and I. And then one day he laid something on me, man. He laid this thing on me. He said, Kefele, when you become an administrator, he said the purpose of your supervision of staff teachers will be their continual improvement and in instruction period and i said huh cuz i'm thinking about all the components all the aspects of school leadership but he said he said kafele the purpose of your supervision of staff is the continual improvement of their instruction he said everything else is secondary he said your, your role is to make teachers better your role is to grow teachers and, 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 and I listened to it, but it didn't resonate with me. I just heard it. I stored it. And then when I became assistant principal, I didn't even refer to it. It's like it was it's like he never said it because I was, you know, I've told you guys several times I was a disciplinarian. I was an inventory clerk. I was I was a cafeteria supervisor. I was bus duty guy. You know, those are the things I did. I didn't do instruction, although I did evaluate about 30 teachers. How did I do it? I don't know. I probably did them all a disservice, right? Because that was how I was trained to be a principal. So now I become a principal and I'm still operating like that assistant principal and I figure it out. No, this is not going to make teachers great by being that guy. My role now, now with, with this gentleman, Dr. King has said to me, the purpose of your supervision of teachers is their continual improvement in instruction. They have to grow. So now I had to reinvent myself. I had, I, I, I had to look at leadership, school leadership, through a brand new lens. So, so now I'm a different guy. Now, I noticed one of my students is on here from that, time, that period in my life uh, where it's my man, Jimma. Good to see you, sir. See, see it's, it's uh, back in those days, I'm trying to figure it out, figure it out. So now here we go. You got to engage in that self-reflection daily. You got to engage in that self-assessment daily. You got to engage in that self-adjustment daily, right? So what yeah, I'm, I'm good on time. Let me go right to number seven. Am I walking? So so I, so I, so I asked you about your your it, it, that first that question I just asked you. What is my per, what is the purpose of my supervision of staff? And now I'm asking you, so are you therefore walking in your purpose, right? Given that that is your purpose, I'm just asking you, are you walking in it? It's so important that you walk in it regularly. And for those of you, because I know you're out here watching or you'll watch or the folks will see the video later. I know you're saying, but wait a minute. My principal, my principal is using me X, Y, Z way. And I can't do the things you're saying, Principal Kefele. Well, 
Those of you who didn't see the, the previous weeks, you better go back and watch weeks one through five because I talk about how in week one, I believe it was, how you've got to study. If you're in that situation, you just got to study your principal as if your principal was an extension of your graduate school courses. You got to study that person. So although you're being 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 constricted, restricted to what you're doing, you got to you, you, you got to study that person as if they were a graduate school course, looking at them and learning what you would do and what you would not do or thinking about how you would do things differently from that person, how you would do things similarly to that person. But just looking at that person and using them as your graduate school course extension. Right. So let's keep going. I'm almost done. Um, number eight. Can I in good conscience refer to myself? This is a big one, y'all. Can I in good conscience refer to myself as an instructional leader in my school? And what I mean by that question when I say in good conscience, what you say and who you are have to match. See, you could, like I'll go to, a, I'll, I'll do a workshop in, a, in some district or some conference somewhere and I'll say, raise your hand if you're an instructional leader. All the hands go up, right? If it's a room full of principals and APs. But the question then becomes, is that how you're being perceived back at the school? Because see, if 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 you're if you claim if if you're claiming instructional leadership, like like, yeah, that's what I do. Yeah, I am, I am he, I am her. But then you go and survey the staff back at the school and they're like, huh? He he comes in my room like maybe once once per semester. Then you're you're not instructional leader. Right. You, you, you just you just think you're an instructional leader. You just claiming something you're not. So, again, that's it. Can I in good conscience refer to myself as instructional leader in my school and in my note? What you say and who you are have to match. They have to align. They have to join. You can't say you this, but you really that you can't say you this, but you really that. Right. It's if you this, that have to align. So, again, that 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 requires to go to the mirror. And I'm glad somebody said, ouch. And, 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 you know, I haven't said this in five, six weeks now. My questions are designed for you to say, ouch. I, a long time ago, I used to refer to myself as a motivational speaker. I got out of that business. I'm in the discomfort business. Right. I call myself a discomfort speaker. My, my role is to speak to audiences and make them say ouch. My role is to speak to an audience and make them feel a little tension, a little uneasiness, a little discomfort within them. Because it's it's the uneasiness, the discomfort, the tension and the sting, the ouch that makes people change. If I get on here and do a feel good every week, you ain't going to change because I'm just I'm just affirming you. So I can get on here and just do a motivational hype, 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 hype. Ah! And now you all hype. Oh, man, you got to check the fail out, man. He gets you fired up. Ah! No, I don't want to be that guy. I want you to sit there and watch me. And you like, man, this dude, he's saying some stuff. I don't even know if I want to listen to him next week because he, he he made me uncomfortable, man. I was feeling real comfort. I was really feeling real comfortable in, in, in what I do. But see, I want you to feel some discomfort within your comfort. I want you to feel some uneasiness within your comfort. I want you to feel some tension within your comfort or else what do you need me for? I don't need to do this and you don't need to listen to me, right? Because... All of us have to grow, including me. That's why I read, right? That's why I'm observing. That's why I listen, because I'm trying to grow in this business, right? Let me let me wrap it up. There was a guy last week. He said, man, sometimes Kefele would deviate from his point and start doing some storytelling and all this kind of stuff. And I had to correct him, because, see, that was doing the social justice piece. And I had to tell him, hear me, somebody, and I hope you're on here, sir. But I'm saying this out of respect. I'm a black man. Right. And, 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 and see, there's a cultural component to 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 presenting because, see, at, at culturally, storytelling is a part of black culture It's a part of African culture. Right. So I like to infuse stories, not because I deliberately infuse them, but because it's inherently in me. See, it's 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 just a part. See, it's you talk about making distinction and being culturally proficient and understanding the difference in cultures of black, white, Latino, Asian, whomever, right? Well, when you talk about this African American presenter, this black man, he's going to infuse stories and examples and illustrations because culturally, it's just in the blood, man. 
Y'all hear me? It's not me studying this and say, okay, how can I infuse an illustration here? How can I infuse an illustration? We storytellers that culturally going back to studying Africa thousands of years ago, there's a word called griot. G-R-I-O-T, griot, which is mispronounced griot, but griot, where we're storytellers. We tell stories. That's how we pass the history down from one generation to the next. So don't get mad at me when you hear me telling stories. I am just acting out my culture. This person was mad at me last week, man. He, I mean, he was barking on the thread, like three or four different posts, sir, or anybody. If you listen to a black speaker, sometimes their culture is going to come out and, and we just ride with that. Right. So that's so that's a part of that cultural understanding, cultural, um, cultural proficiency. Right. Cultural competency. That's all a part of it. Right. So I, even that was just a story because that, that wasn't part of my script today. Right. So let me let me keep going. Number uh, number nine. It, number nine is a continuation of number eight. So when I talked about can I in good conscience call myself an instructional leader, number nine is saying, if not, what is impeding your ability to do so? So I, ha I had on here a note to go all into a framework I created called the Closing the Attitude Gap Framework. But at 12 o'clock, that wouldn't be fair. So we're going to introduce that to you another time. So number 10, if student discipline is the primary impediment between me being an effective instructional leader and a school disciplinarian, what measures can I, will I take to be the instructional leader I was trained to be in grad school, right? Now, that's a lot. Those of you that write, that write these questions, just, just look at the video and rewind it, rewind at that point and, and, and get that because I, I, it's 12 and I, I want to be respectful of time. But those are the 10 questions. He, he, here's my takeaway. My parting assignment, take a deep, honest, self-reflective, self-assessing look at who you are currently as instructional leader and determine how you will correct whatever weaknesses or deficiencies that exist within your leadership relative to what we talked about today. I got four more weeks of this. I got so much more to talk about under the umbrella of instructional leadership. But again, take a deep, honest, self-reflective, self-assessing look at who you are currently as an instructional leader and determine how you will correct whatever deficiencies, whatever weaknesses exist under that umbrella, right? So next week we go to part two of instructional leadership, but let me say this to you. Don't run yet. Just give me, let me give you, let me, let me just throw these at you. Number, Next, I have a, for those of you that want to go to another level, I do a, a school leadership institute every summer in July for two days in a different city. Well, we got a pandemic, so it'll be virtual. It's called the third annual school leadership institute with Principal Cafele, July 15 and 16. It was supposed to be in Norfolk, but it will be virtual. It has a small fee. If you go to my website, principalcafele.com and just scroll on my home page and you'll see it. There's a link there. Click the link. If you want to join us two days, it'll be three hours a day. So if you want to kind of get a little more intense beyond what I talk about here, three hours on the 15th, three hours on the 16th, we're just going, we're going to go hard on, um, on, on various aspects of school leadership, principal leadership, assistant principal leadership with a particular focus on principal leadership, but APs need to hear that. So join me. All right, that's, go to principalcafele.com, scroll down my homepage and look for third annual school leadership institute and then click that link and then go in and register and I'll see you on July 15 and 16. Also subscribe to my channel, School Leadership Thoughts. And some of you don't know, I got the interview videos on the channel. So there's, there's well over a thousand people who are assistant principals be, solely because they watch those videos. So I got those videos that I made um, too. Uh, thoughts to consider for um, for the assistant principal job interview. And then there's a virtual one as well for how to interview in front of a computer. Right. So um, just go to my channel, School Leadership Thoughts, and subscribe to it so that every time I drop a new video, you'll receive it. And then lastly, again, you got to get your hands on this. The assistant principal 50 it's in stock wherever education books are sold. Amazon's got thousands. Right. ASCD.org has thousands. Um, Barnes and Noble, wherever you want to get them. But while you're getting it, you may as well get its companion, the aspiring Principal 50. You got to get its companion. They're not the same book. 
So this one is the companion for those of you who want to be a principal, those of you who want to be an assistant principal, those of you who are new principals. I wrote this for you, too, because it says critical questions for new and future school leaders. And then while you're at it, you might as well get the trilogy, the principal 50. Right. So that's the book dealing with the principalship. And then lastly, to round it out, is my school a better school because I lead it? Get all four. You go to anywhere books are sold, get all four at the same site and then you got them all. And then um, I, I feel very good that they will take your, your leadership to another level. And then I'm done. Hey, folks, we're in the middle of a pandemic. I think a lot of the country forgot that, but we're still in it. So make sure that you are taking care of you. Keep your hands washed. Keep the mask on. Stay six feet apart from one another. You feel like you got to sneeze, do it like this. Don't or cough or whatever. Don't do it like this because then you're going to be shaking somebody's hand. But better yet, don't shake their hand. Just make sure that you realize there's still a pandemic and take care of yourselves. Get that exercise in. I'm doing three miles today, right? So get that exercise in. Eat correctly, eat right, so that I'm not reading that somebody that used to come on the on the don't on the academy thread has had made a transition because they weren't taking care of themselves. If you're with me now, I want you to be with me forever, right? So make sure that you're doing the things you should be doing in order for you to stay healthy over the long haul. I will see you next uh, Saturday at 11 o'clock Eastern for part two of our instructional leadership. And of course, we're going to infuse social justice education because that's the context that the world is in right now. So I appreciate you all being here. I will see you soon. We say have a great week. Have an extraordinary week. Have your best week yet. Peace. Then we flip it sideways. Peace. Then we go with the thumb. Thumbs up. And then we cock the fist back and we count the three. One, two, three. Bam. I'll see you next week.